Good morning, everybody, and welcome to VG Myths, the online internet video game TV show whose belly is not yet full. In Dead Rising, you take the role of Frank West, a hot-headed, underhanded, hotshot paparazzi with nothing better to do than to invade people's privacy. You've got 72 hours to interview the survivors of a recent zombie epidemic holed up in Willamette Mall and uncover the truth hidden within. But with an army of zombies blocking the halls, you'll need to get creative to arrive at all your appointments on time. When most players hear the word creative, they tend tend to gravitate towards the chainsaw aisle, but I like to think Frank West is too calm and professional to resort to violence to solve his problems. Which is why we're making it our mission to uncover the biggest story of Frank's life while leaving every zombie in the condition we found it. Can you beat Dead Rising without killing any zombies? Thankfully, as you've probably already noticed, Dead Rising has a counter permanently affixed to the bottom right corner of the screen, letting you know the exact number of undead you've processed into regular dead. The run is a officially complete when we reach the conclusion of the game's story with the kill counter at zero. Sitting in a closet for six hours is not gonna cut it, only the game's highest ranking ending counts for completion. Additionally, Dead Rising has a new game plus feature allowing you to reset the game while keeping your current stats and certain unlockable items. Even without killing zombies as an option, we could potentially grind up Frank to max level with infinite time to spare. In the interests of keeping this challenge as interesting as possible, New Game Plus is banned. We have to complete a single playthrough of the game starting from level one. At level one, to be frank, we suck. We're extremely slow, can barely hold anything in our inventory, and die at the drop of a hat. To make matters worse, getting caught by zombies doesn't just make us die, it gets the zombies killed too. Almost all methods of escaping a zombie grapple will fling the zombie attacking you away. If another zombie gets hit by this newly launched undead projectile, they usually don't survive the encounter. We need to avoid grapples like the plague. As we climb up the level up ladder, Frank gets both past of stat boosts and unique abilities, some of which are absolutely crucial to getting through unscathed. To get Frank up to snuff and ready to tackle the main case, we'll be juggling every side quest we get our hands on and keeping an eye out for photo ops to gain crucial prestige points and train Frank into the ultimate zombie dodging master. On the first day, zombies are still thin in number, so even at level 1, you can pass by them with minimal setbacks. Frank is completely immune to grapples while in midair. Time a jump right when entering a zombie's grapple range and they'll fruitlessly stumble towards you instead. We're able to pass through the first few story missions, after which the game gives a lengthy break during which the player is expected to relax and explore them all a bit, but for us, no time is downtime. It's a mad dash to get as much PP as possible and prepare for the horrors to come. In super good news, by this point we've leveled up enough to unlock the Zombie Ride. The Zombie Ride is by far the most important move in Frank's arsenal, allowing the player to harmlessly climb up on a zombie's shoulders and make a jump past them. Not only does this give us decent mid-air distance, there's a secret ultimate bonus attribute. Every time you mount a zombie, a grace period begins during which zombies are banned from initiating a grapple, even if you walk right up to their face. Abuse this grace period and you can potentially combo chain zombies across the entire map. There's just one big caveat. The zombie ride lets Frank fly over zombies, and only Frank. Everybody else... Hey! Follow yes. me! No Follow me! Help me! As anybody who's played the game is thoroughly aware, the Willamette school system is an absolute failure. The residents randomly stop to take idle animation breaks, get caught on walls, get caught on each other, and just about the only thing they are good at is satisfying the zombies' appetites. But we can't just leave these innocent people to die. We can take advantage of their plight for personal gain. Survivors are the most lucrative source of PP available, giving a morsel when recruited and a smorgasbord upon delivery to the security room. Since we're incapable of clearing the path manually, we've got no choice but to babysit this ragtag bunch of misfits and turn them into a vaguely competent zombie fighting team. Since the mall is still mostly empty, these first few survivors are just a matter of weaving around empty space. Plus, any survivors that ask you to carry them are a free ride. I mean, for them, sure, but also for you. You're immune to grapples while carrying someone and can push right by in record time. This isn't the case for survivors who want you to hold their hand, though. Not only are you still just as vulnerable 
vulnerable as always, these survivors are pacifists and refuse to wield any weapons. Getting them through is a major test of patience, but I assure you, it is eventually possible. It's a good time to note, you should be saving the game whenever you do basically anything, so you'll have a backup to reload when you inevitably fail. During the first night is the phone call for Out of Control, an important side quest featuring the Adam boss fight. You might have some reservations about killing him, but don't worry, Adam is a totally normal human being. Only zombies increment the kill counter, meaning there are absolutely no moral quandaries preventing you from violently murdering people. If you can somehow manage to convince Greg to stop punching zombies long enough, he'll unlock a shortcut that instantly teleports you between Wonderland and Paradise Plaza, saving you tons of travel time over the course of the playthrough. On top of that, Adam drops a small chainsaw which respawns every time you reload the area, giving an infinite supply. The small chainsaw does ludicrous high damage, can be stocked in your inventory, and can be given to survivors. These will be your main weapon against almost every upcoming boss, and a survivor armed with one instantly becomes 10 steps higher on the zombie survival ladder. I figured out a decent way to convince them to kill zombies, too. They seem to be more willing to take a swing if Frank gives them a command while already standing relatively close to where you tell them to go. So constantly scream, and eventually they'll be convinced to clear a path. Maybe. Just be careful they don't murder each other. Also, please don't forget to politely ask them to return your chainsaws before entering the security room. Otherwise, they'll just eat them. With some small chainsaws in tow, we rescue every survivor Otis calls us about well into day two. I somehow even managed to convince a group to rescue Pamela for me. <laughs> Don't ask me how, I'm honestly still not sure, and God knows they have no idea. Unfortunately, all these extended escort quests were starting to catch up with me, and I had to get my priorities straight. Gordon is too much of a coward to lead all the way across the mall in time, and convincing him to rescue Nick and Sally is more trouble than it's worth. So instead, I just punched him in the face and immediately abandoned him once the recruitment bonus kicked in. As for Nick and Sally, don't worry. I took the opportunity to immortalize them as history's greatest motivational posters. It's nowhere near as much PP as we'd get for rescuing them, but we've banked a good number of level ups already that I'm comfortable letting a few survivors slip through the cracks. But when meeting Isabella at midnight, something really unfortunate happens. If Isabella dies, the truth fades into darkness, so this is kind of a pickle. I tried toy swords cabbages, surf bot masks, and chainsaws, but this zombie is a bit too stubborn. He either shrugs it off or dies trying. But here's the trick. Since he only lets go when he dies, why not just ask somebody else to kill him? As far as the game is concerned, it's not legally a zombie kill if you're not the one who pulls the trigger. It's a bit unorthodox, and I don't think Isabella expected me to bring company, but she brought a friend too, so I think she'll forgive me. It's also at this moment I realize survivors with shotguns are ludicrously OP. Equip two or three of them and they'll start mowing down entire hordes. We lead a couple more groups of shotgun-toting survivors into day three, with Frank's level respectably in the 30s. We're probably strong enough to do the rest of the game's story now, which is good news, because I've got bad news. Carlito said that he'd blow up the mall if he were cornered. <laughs> Carlitos planted five bombs across the maintenance tunnels beneath the mall, we've got hardly any time to pick them all up, and the maintenance tunnels are absolutely in. Fested. Normally, you'd drive through the horde on a motorcycle like an ultimate badass, but zombies are too fragile to drive through, so going on foot is the only option. Before heading down, I highly recommend making some untouchable smoothies from the pies and orange juice in Paradise Plaza. These prevent zombies from grappling you, but only last about 30 seconds, so make them count. However, I ended up only having two of these on hand and already saved with absolutely no time to spend blending more, so they're not gonna ride us the whole Way. With crowds this thick, you'll need to constantly abuse the zombie ride. Lure a zombie to grapple you, jump off them, then use your grace period to find another zombie to launch off. If there's zombies surrounding one of the bomb trucks, you don't necessarily need to waste an untouchable smoothie. There's just enough time during the zombie ride grace period to stop for the door opening and bomb collecting animations. And though the odds seem stacked against us, we're not alone. 
Carlito has apparently been touched by our unflinching dedication to zombie survival and acts as our escort, running over and blowing up zombies to clear the way, or maybe even managing to free us after a seemingly guaranteed game over. And if that wasn't enough, he's got a secret special ability. Give him the cue by lightly tapping his face with your chainsaw to engage Carlito's super ultimate reality warping cutscene powers. You'll be teleported to the right edge of the map, cutting out a huge chunk of the trip. Thanks to Carlito's help, we make it out of the tunnels with all five bombs and the maintenance tunnel key with only seconds to spare. Now that we're out of that hectic situation, we've got a little bit more breathing room with a hefty bit more time on the clock as we follow Isabella to her hideout. She's way more competent than other survivors and zombies refuse to grapple her, so are you serious? Right here. Shoot, shoot him. No, no, Isabella. What? Why? <laughs> Isabella is exactly as stupid and idiotic as other survivors, even if zombies don't grapple her. So she wastes basically all of our time, and we have to make a mad dash rush to get the next couple story cases done. This is why we needed to grab that maintenance tunnel key. With all the time Isabella wastes, the shortcut down to the butcher shop is absolutely vital. After doing some of our own butchering and making some pit stops at both Isabella's hideout and the security room, all of Dead Rising's main cases are finally complete, and we've arrived at the facts. There are no more scoops from now on. All that's left is to wait for the helicopter to arrive at noon on day four. So we've got plenty of time to kill. Normally, you'd pass the time killing zombies, which is obviously illegal, but never fear, the military has arrived to save us from our boredom. These highly trained special forces soldiers are worth 5,000 PP a pop. And when I say highly trained, I mean at the Willamette branch. Pass the night away with these jolly fellows, and the helicopter will be here before you know it. Pay a quick visit to Isabella for a cutscene at 10 p.m., be on the landing pad at noon, and the end cutscene will initiate. With Frank on his way out and the truth completely revealed, the dead rising pacifist question mark run? T yeah, no, of course not, nobody's falling for this one. It's time for overtime mode. Since our ride's out of the picture, and Frank somehow managed to get himself infected during all those zombie dog piles, we'll be spending one last day in the mall fetching items for an antidote. At first the mall is almost completely empty, but once Isabella asks us to grab 10 queen bees, it will fill right back up. Normally you obtain queens by killing zombies, but we've got a couple backup plans. First, blend a bunch of orange juice together to make a ton of nectar smoothies. Whenever you drink one, a queen will spawn and arrive directly next to Frank, even if there are no zombies in the area. You have to wait until nectar's effects wear off to drink another one, otherwise a queen won't spawn. Which is where the second backup comes in. Head to a populated area and sit tight while the military does your job for you. They're not very good at it, but eventually they'll kill some queen zombies and you can come in after to mop up. After giving nine queens to Isabella, hold on one second before handing her the tenth. Go back and blend together a ton of untouchable smoothies first. The final section of the game has Isabella escorting you through a zombie-infested tunnel. Thankfully, you don't need to escort her. She's covered in a magic zombie repellent, but you are completely defenseless. Keep chugging those untouchable smoothies till you reach the jeep at the end, and you're home free. There are no zombies during the tank battle, and even if you get knocked off while fighting Brock, you've got just enough time to zombie ride back up. With the final hit landed on Brock and zero killed, still proudly displayed at the bottom of the screen, the Dead Rising pacifist question mark run is mission complete. Before we head out, special thanks to Adam, who suggested the run a few months back. It was an absolutely fun one to figure out. Dead Rising is one of my favorite games, and reliving it with this challenge was a great way to get reacquainted with Willamette Mall. And somehow, I think it might be possible to push the run a little further. I was way late at realizing survivors with shotguns were so OP, and it cost me a ton of time, not to mention I barely used any juice. I bet if somebody routed things out absolutely perfectly and maybe used a ton of quick step smoothies, they could save every possible survivor and get the true ending with zero zombies killed. All starting from level one. Maybe next Halloween. See you in a year, everybody. Special shout out to Dead Rising historian and YouTuber Stippo for listening to my absolutely unnecessary request to mod the game and remove the end credits from the end credits. And, of course, special thanks to all Patreon backers, including Andrew Seibert, Mrs. Segman, Eric Flynn, Les Lamb, David 20 Covers, RB Drock, Zolin O, Chaz M, Mr. Harry Wonka, Alexander Bakken, Chris Nate, Anyu, Salieri, Ross Clark, Igrira, Jez, Robert B. Brachier, Citrus Lush, Zaina Bane, BCR Main Sound, Joshua Bradbury, Vincent Hall, Bass Singer 313, Vincent YT, Yellow Alert, Game Guy Rusty, Anon 42, 
Suit, Robert Cephazon, Alex Nelson, I'm Going to Unban Julia Sino, Pepsi Man EXE, Christian Long, Jen Duro, Justin L, The Quacky Gamer, Chocolate Boy 97, Bainbridge, Sean, Kazoy, TJ Super Kitty Bot, and that one weird person, I guess. Let me know how much this video sucks and how I can improve in the comments below. You're all fantastic for watching and get out of my house. You know how to use this? Kinda. I've covered Super Mario Odyssey without jumping. <laughs>